Yeah, hi there. It is February 26th and uncertainty has certainly come back to the market. So this is a follow-up to my uh, video that I did uh, at the outset of the coronavirus breakout in January. So just to give you an update, what we know, what we don't know, and how it's affecting the market so far. So today we learned actually that the number of cases uh, of the coronavirus, uh, the total number of cases outside of China is now higher than inside of China. So this is obviously one of the main reasons the markets are getting very nervous and how the coronavirus will impact the economy whether it'll shut down entire countries. Uh, you know, as we reported in January, the, you know, the response in China was actually quite good. I mean, the authorities moved very quickly uh, to quarantine the cities that were affected. But what's happened now is obviously in a globalized world, you know, people travel. So this virus has really taken on uh, quite a life of its own. So. Uh, what spooked the market uh, just the other day was that we had a case or a couple of cases in Italy uh, that sparked uh, uh, worries in Europe about closing borders. So um, the various agencies were on the, uh, you know, giving out information yesterday. So on Monday, uh, the WHO, the World Health Organization, gave some more positive news uh, basically that there was a drop in new infections in China. So that was actually good news. Uh, certainly that was before we knew about uh, cases now popping up in the rest of the world. Uh, then yesterday on Tuesday, the CDC um, gave a more uh, dire kind of assessment basically saying in terms of the United States, it's just a matter of time. Uh, when uh, the virus arrives here in the United States, not a qu question of if. So that was obviously the, the reason the market kind of sold off yesterday. So, you know, in Europe now, we're seeing cases in Italy. Uh, in Austria, they uh, halted a train that was coming from, uh, from Italy going to, to Austria. And there was, you know, a debate whether they should close borders. Uh, then the latest uh, today, uh, Germany confirmed uh, cases there. Uh, and the part that's a little bit more worrying as well is that they can't really verify the origin or the chain of contagion uh, of those cases. So that just creates a lot of uncertainty. And obviously markets do not like uncertainty. So just a little bit of um, uh, um, color on vaccines. I mean, there's a lot of information that's floating around on vaccines. I mean, if you talk to the scientists on the virus, I mean, the, the, the science behind this, this uh, coronavirus, which is a SARS type of a virus, is not that complicated. It just takes a long time for the scientists to do all the testing. So we learned yesterday from the, uh, from the HH, HHS uh, the Health and Human Services uh, uh, um, team um, that, you know, the testing that's going on right now the, on the messenger RNA that's being tested in the mice uh, is going on and we're expecting phase one human trials in about a month and a half. So that's good news. Uh, the, the problem is um, to go to phase two, where you have a larger population of humans. So phase one typically is 40 people. Uh, phase two, you're looking at hundreds of people. And typically in phase two, that's when you can give, um, you know, the material to cases, you know, that, that are very severe uh, cases where, where you think the uh, patient cannot survive. So you can use phase two type uh, applications for these patients, but that's only going to happen about six months from now. So the bad news here from the science and from the vaccination point of view, it's going to take at least six to eight months before you have any kind of a vaccine. That, that basically means uh, vaccines are not going to come to the rescue for this current outbreak. It basically gives you something for the next uh, year, the next season, or the next uh, breakout like this. So, um, look, we, we, from a economic point of view, uh, you know, we've, we've tried to, to take a look at this. 
you know, we get a lot of material from some of the best economists on the street that you, we used to work with, uh, certainly uh, our friends, our former C.J. Lawrence uh, colleagues like Nancy Lazar, for instance, at Cornerstone. Uh, she's done a lot of work uh, relating to supply chains. Uh, and, you know, we reported a lot on supply chain di disruptions relating to the tariffs last year. So one of the things that was were quite bullish going into 2020 was we weren't going to talk about tar tariff warfare anymore. And, uh, you know, the, basically how that m makes supply chains or disrupts supply chains. But now we're talking about the virus and how that is, is uh, affecting supply chains. So if we remember... Uh, the Wuhan area in China is actually one of the key areas where you have a lot of production, manufacturing, and also in the technology side. So semiconductors and a lot of the parts that go into the uh, supply chain for whether it's iPhones or whatever. It's not just a, a demand issue. So whether, you know, uh, restaurants like Starbucks or uh, stores that sell Nike sneakers or uh, Disney, uh, you know, Disney World in China are closed, it's also a supply issue. So, you know, Nancy Lazar at uh, Cornerstone has done some very good work on this. So if you think about disruptions, if we close down the entire supply chain from China uh, for about a month, uh, we can withstand that. There's plenty of inventories in the economy, in the global economy relating to these goods and services. You know, the the Industries that are most affected here are certainly in the textile side. If you think about all the clothing and things that are, are or shoes that are, I mean, basically 90% of all shoes are, are actually, if you think about sneakers and so forth, these are actually produced in China. So that's a major area of disruption from a supply point of view. Then you have transport equipment uh, that, you know, auto parts and, and so forth, and actually batteries. You know, China is a very big producer of batteries. Um, then computer and electronics, you know, that's kind of the iPhone uh, supply chain. And industrial machinery as well, you know, don't, don't underestimate that. So those areas, so what we've learned from Nancy is uh, if we have these kind of disruptions every month continuing, we would take about a quarter percent off of GDP growth uh, each month. So depending how long this goes, in my last video, I kind of said maybe naively that uh, we would see a peak in activity in this virus in April. And that really has to do with the life cycle of these types of viruses. I mean, these types of viruses are very similar to the flu virus and obviously the, you know, the main period where you have contagion is always in this kind of winter period. So by the time we get to warmer weather, uh, which is April and May, typically the, the uh, contagion in these or the spread of these types of viruses kind of subsides. So hopefully that will, will happen. But so, you know, we're, we're looking at our forecast and how this affects earnings. We have so far very little data on actual hard data, how the virus is affecting uh, the economy. We see a lot of anecdotal uh, information certainly coming from the companies. As we mentioned, uh, a lot of restaurants that are active in places like China are closed. Uh, I have a daughter that is going to school, to college right now in Europe, and she has friends who are also in Italy. Uh, it's interesting to hear that they've actually closed schools in Italy for a couple of weeks just to see uh, for the authorities to kind of get a handle of this. I would expect the same to happen in other places uh, in Europe, uh, maybe in Germany as well. Uh, in France, we have not seen any cases so far. So that's something to watch. Um, so supply chain disruptions is a key area that we're watching in terms of the effect on, on all of this. I mean, the good news going into this coronavirus uh, uh, situation is that similar to the SARS breakout in 2003, global short rates, meaning the liquidity that's going into the economy is very, very strong. So yields are very, very low. Interest rates are very low around the world. So there's ample liquidity going into the market. 
to sustain economies. I mean, the authorities in, in from China to the United States are all watching this. This is this is a what uh, George Soros called re reflexivity. Uh, we did not have any re reflexivity going into the 08 financial crisis. Re reflexivity really means that policymakers are watching these things and are responding in a positive way or, uh, to these situations. So central banks around the world get it. They're providing liquidity. Uh, and also from a fiscal point of view, we're seeing uh, governments around the world opening their, their, their wallets, so to speak, and their budgets to actual fiscal stimulus to make sure that uh, we don't see major economic disruptions. So China, um, China will certainly see negative uh, GDP growth in, the, in this current quarter. You know, there are all sorts of estimates that we're seeing. You know, some are even saying that the year-on-year -year, um, GDP decline in this quarter uh, for China will be about 14%. That is a huge number for an economy of that size. So we'll see how that plays out uh, in the United States. You know, our, our forecast is still around 2.4, 2.5% GDP growth for this year. That was actually an acceleration from, if we remember the tail end of 2019, where we were about at 2%. You know, the overhangs then were tariff warfare uh, and so forth. So, you know, that the, the difference between going from 2018 to to 2019, GDP growth was slowing, and then the Fed uh, injected all this liquidity, lowered rates three times, and we got a version of quantitative easing that really put a floor under the, the U.S. economy, basically giving you a guarantee that we would not see a recession. So th the good news here is leading economic indicators are actually pointing up in the United States quite dramatically. And that, the last reading we got there was in January. Certainly, we're looking into the rear view mirror here, and we do not know yet what the, the uh, coronavirus outbreak, what effect that has had on anything. But, you know, this is happening in the context of very low interest rates, similar to 2003 when we had SARS, uh, and an economic environment that is actually better than we had back in the, in the 2003, where the economy is actually accelerating. So, we're watching all this very closely. So. I have to, of course, also mention the election cycle. Uh, that is having an effect on, on the market as well. Uh, you know, Bernie Sanders is the front runner for the Democratic Party at the moment. And we saw a couple of uh, um, debates where there was quite a lot of uncertainty about, uh, you know, whether moderate candidates or progressive candidates would take the upper hand. At the moment, Bernie Sanders is clearly the front runner there. So the market implications here are, you know, kind of playing out more precisely on in the healthcare insurance side. If we look at healthcare insurance stocks, they've sold off a lot. The reason is uh, obviously the uh, Bernie Sanders plan will is intended to do away with private health insurance and would go to an all government run program. So look, we, our view on the election cycle is that the extreme event here is quite un, uh, unrealistic. I mean, the probability of a Bernie Sanders takeover, even if even if he should get elected, which we think is a low probability event, um, his more more extreme policies will unlikely be adopted by Congress or the Senate. So the only uh, the worst case scenario for the markets would be if you have a Bernie Sanders victory plus the Congress and the Senate, and we think that's quite, quite unlikely. But look, I mean, it's having an effect on the market. So, you know, back in the, uh, my last video in January, um, I pointed to the market technicals. Uh, maybe we can take a quick look at that uh, here again. Um, if you look at you know where the market is right now. Uh, here, the uh, this is this is the S and P 500, uh, basically. Um, look, uh, right out of the gate, uh, we, we had quite a, a a increase. I mean, if you look at uh, just this move here, 
um, that was quite a substantial move. And, and what I was saying in January was it's unlikely for the market to sustain this gap here to the 200 day moving average, which is the long term average of the S&P 500. So what has happened because of the coronavirus uncertainties, because of the election cycle, you know, which is, you know, the market is feeling the burn, which is Bernie Sanders. You know, we've taken away just all of this froth here in the market. So, but you can see the market is still in an uptrend. It's not like we've broken down into a kind of bear market scenario. Uh, certainly that drop was painful. I mean, this is a, you know, 8% or 7% drop. Uh, but in terms of normal markets and volatility, this is actually quite normal. So this is not, you know, we're not running for the hills here and uh, too worried. So in terms of, uh, which I mentioned in my last video as well, uh, are we putting new money to work? I mean, that's always the key question. What are you doing with that new dollar that we're getting? You know, we're very patient. Uh, we think there's plenty of support here at the moving average, uh, which is the 200 day moving average. That's about at, you know, 3,040 on the S&P 500. I would not be surprised if we break through it and test it. Uh, but I very much doubt we would have an event uh, like we had back in the, the Christmas period where we had this complete sell off uh, in terms of because the, the macroeconomic the conditions were actually improving before we had this event. And if you think about, you know, both the election and the virus, both of these things will pass. You know, these are not, uh, you know, uh, uh, conditions that will remain too long. Certainly the election will be over in November and we'll know who, who how the policy, impl what the policy impl uh, implications will be. And the virus certainly by the summer will be, uh, will be uh, uh, over. So, you know, we, we're still constructive when it comes to equities. Um, we're just looking for better entry points. Uh, we're, we're getting that now, but you know, the market could go down another five or 6% before we get to the moving averages. So we're being quite patient. So that's it for, for now. And I'll see you uh, next month. Take care.